from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020, sponsored by Intel, AWS, and our community partners. Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. It's virtual this year because of the pandemic. We can't be in person normally we're doing these interviews face to face, but we're here remote. I'm your host, John Furrier. We're theCUBE virtual and we're here with Teresa Carlson, who is the chief and heads up the public sector business uh, for AWS and also now has industries, which is a lot of the verticals and just continues to um, have great leadership and continues to do well in the business side. Teresa, great to see you for the eighth consecutive CUBE interview. You've been on every year and we thank you for coming on. Big year this year, thanks for coming on. Great to see you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. It's hard to believe it's eight years already. Wow, going Lots by have, fast. Well, first of all, I want to say congratulations. Um, the first year you were on, you never wavered. You always had a North Star. Um, you had the Amazonian kind of way. Um, you told us what you were going to do and you did it. The CIA came on board and the dots just connected. So congratulations. This year more than ever um, during your keynote at reInvent, even though it was virtual, um, again, I'm, and you're raising the bar on the theme, leadership and making use of the data. Two major themes this year on your keynote because of the pandemic and just because of the cloud computing benefits are all kind of coming together. You're helping more people than ever doing more public service with cloud when it needs it the most. This has been a big story. Share your, your reaction to that. Yeah, well, John, thank you again for having me in your coverage of reInvent. It's been three weeks of, wow. I mean, three weeks, we do one, now we're doing three. Uh, but COVID, you know, we're still, we're still not done, right? The vaccinations are out. People are starting to, I saw on the television yesterday here in the US, the first nurse that was vaccinated, uh, but, for us, I will tell you the data side of this piece during COVID has been huge. I mean, huge. It has been, you know, our customers have always said data is golden for them, right? Uh, but during COVID, we have actually seen the use of data just go up like crazy. And not just the use of it, but um, I will say it's multiple data lakes that are used, hydrating multiple data lakes and using that data to merge. So if you think about economic data and health data and putting those data sets together in a way that they have deeper understanding of what's happening uh, within their uh, community, their state, their, their, uh, their country. So we've seen a merging of data uh, in a big way. If you think about the vaccinations themselves, uh, John, that wouldn't have been possible to move this fast without the use of scalable compute processing and analytics in a way like no one has ever seen it and uh, it's 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 pretty amazing and I don't think we'll ever go back and also I'll just say sharing of that data has changed researchers are now much more open to sharing that data our core 19 uh, research site that we've done has uh, thousands of researchers on it now, uh, hundreds of thousands of views on it with people sharing research about COVID. And think about that. I mean, research has always been held tightly and now we're really starting to see them open up and share that data so that we can move much faster. I think doing that public service with the data has always been a killer idea. We talked about national parks being kind of open for the people over the years now, supercomputing and data. You guys do a great job doing that. But the other area that you're getting a lot of press on and, and, and rightfully so is an area that I know is close to your heart as well as our mission, which is getting people trained up on cloud computing. Uh, and you've done this for years, but this year more importantly with all the, the pressure and all the need, you guys have offered offering a huge training uh, skills training for 29 million people globally. I saw that on the news. I saw you on uh, doing uh, some TV interviews on this. It's been all over the press. It's been getting a lot of great buzz. Can you tell me more about what that is? Yeah, so part of my, when I picked up our industry business units, I also picked up our training and certification organization that's run by Maureen Lonegren. I know you've had Maureen on your show before too. And then I have education, which is run by Kim Ajaris in the US and Max uh, Peterson internationally. And we are now, we've merged so that we have a model that we can uh, teach and train around the world in, in a much more scalable way. But this announcement was about going into 200 uh, countries and territories, 
training 29 million people by 2025 free, do free skills training, and making that available, John, through multiple different programs and scaling those. So we'll take the programs we have and we'll scale those up much more rapidly. And then now we'll also look for new programs that we need to run um, in parallel it, because that's what we do. We have to look around corners also and make sure that we have the right programs. And, you know, I've loved, I've loved, you know, they're all amazing, but near and dear to my heart has always been our AWS Educate, which we started uh, for ages 14 and up to at the university and high school level to be able to start to bring on those cloud skills. Then we added badging and credentialing onto that. And from there, you can go into the, our academy, which you can actually get certifications as a solution architect. Uh, but we've, we've added so many more, uh, our program Restart now, which has been really successful, which is about training those who are jobless or in underserved communities in socioeconomic depressed areas. Um, and I love that program. I told a story about an individual in Boston who had opened a training center, a gym. He's a fitness trainer. And he had to close it uh, because, you know, COVID. And he went through our 12-week week restart training program and now has a job with a company there in Boston. And I just love those kind of stories where you know that you're putting people to work. And I think for us, there's thousands and thousands of jobs around the world just in any city if you if you search on uh, cloud computing jobs open i just looked in new york when i was on cnbc i looked in new york and there are ten thousand cloud jobs just there in new york when i just did a quick search so there's always jobs and we've got to make sure that we're skilling them so they can go now fill those jobs and that will help us close that gap uh, john which we still have a big one uh, to get all the jobs filled that are out there that's a great mission and i got to say it's super important because one is cloud computing there's openings for this kind of new the new paradigm which is now mainstream and playing out on the in, in real time as as andy was talking about but also the global it market's being reshaped by cloud computing so you have the intersection of those two which is a new skill. You can't just take IT and make it cloud. You got to bring it together. So it's a great opportunity for someone to come into the industry and level up pretty quickly. You don't have to have the 20 yeah. years of experience to, to do this. It's, you can come in totally instantly level totally. up and have a great job. You know, it's the one thing, John, I, I hear all the time around the world before from like when I would go and speak with university uh, chancellors and presidents, and just professors, they would say, hey, you know, AWS, we need you to do the micro-credentialing along the way. And this was pre-COVID when they said, we need to get, you know, our students want to work while they're in school. Well, now more than ever, it's important. And we also, John, look, just in September, over 800,000 women left the workplace. That is a trend that we do not want and we cannot sustain. And so doing, you know, doing programs like this virtually that you can do self-paced environments, intensive environments. We want to make, we want to make these programs fit for whatever the individual needs. So it's not just a one size, you know, fits all. We want to make sure that the programs that we're providing will fit the needs of the individuals doing the training. And I, I particularly am, uh, I want to push this with our, you know, inclusion and diversity of the individuals that we need to get into the workplace. But it is pretty alarming when you see that many women leaving the workplace. You know, when a choice is being made right now, we're seeing women take the brunt of that. And we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to work virtually, train themselves and get those new jobs at, that are out there in tech. Well, that's one of the questions I had for you. I'll just jump to that now and get back to some of the other ones. But the customers that pivot to remote work and learning, uh, it's changing. And you know, I was um, riffing on an interview, um, I think it was with one of your public sector customers, the future of work. And if you just think about the word work, workforce, workplace, mm -hmm. workload, workflows, the notion of work is now Im impacted. And you mentioned the diversity piece. This is an opportunity. So how should people think about this uh, relearning? So we don't lose people and we actually get a net positive inbound migration to the workforce. You know, I, the, the flexibility I had, I did a fireside chat with Indra Nooney, um, who was the former CEO of PepsiCo and chairman and is now on our Amazon board uh, for reInvent. And she talked about, you know, being your authentic self, uh, curiosity, but one of her big points is women in the workplace. 
Uh, and she's going to publish a new book soon, and it's going to be really focused on kind of equity policy uh, areas of need that we have to focus on to make sure that we have uh, women being able to tackle both the home issues and being able to work and taking advantage of that plus 50 percent. And I would say the virtual opportunity is really fantastic, especially for um, all levels of so socioeconomic individuals, because you can work part-time, full-time, you can work virtually. And I do believe while we all want to get back into the workplace, I think for me, I'm a social animal. I'd love to be there sitting beside you, John. You know, I think for a lot of us, we are we kind of yearn to be back in the office. But there's also a lot that working from home um, is is much more achievable for them, right? Especially with childcare, if school day, if it's a short day because of schools. And allowing flexibility with work is gonna be really important. And COVID has taught us that that is possible. My team did not miss a beat during COVID. I, I tell you, it's like unbelievable. Our business uh, has, has really kind of been on fire because public sector, and if you look at the other industries I picked up, financial services, uh, energy and telecommunications, and training and certification, these are all that had to keep going. Uh, governments were moving faster than ever, so our team was really busy. Uh, I've had individuals ask me, well, how'd you manage the downtime? I was like, we didn't have any downtime. Like literally day one, yeah. we were like 24 seven and the teams were working with it, pretty much every government around the world because COVID moved so quickly uh, and all virtually. And I will have to say, John, I was really skeptical in the beginning about how is this, how, how are we gonna do this? Um, but the teams really, we figured out how to operate. You know, you had to, it's a new muscle. You kind of have to build that virtual work muscle and figure out how you manage your day, how you fit things in. And then there's the point that people think you're always available because you are at home, right? So you can never, that you can't possibly not be available because you know, you're, you are sitting at home. Uh, and then there's the funny times where people's cats walk across and kind of with their tail on their face. And, dogs barking you know, the, on video calls. Yeah, dog, <laughs> a child where it runs in with the diaper. And, you know, it's all, you, you have to have grace and humor about all this sometimes too. Like you can't take everything so seriously. And perhaps we've learned that um, work and life can blend a little bit more, right? Yeah. That you can, you can have that when a lot of people, when they talk about work-life balance, now we have work-life harmony. You know, you and I have talked about this before. If you can tap, whoever taps the diversity um, of talent will also let me win the game. And not just um, diversity in terms of gender or background, role. I mean, if you can tap the virtual yeah. space, you're a winner because there's talent out there that can be aggregated in and there's no stigma associated with anything. So, you know, this is, I think Andy kind of uh, expressed that to me and he heard it in his keynote where he said, hey, people are square, but you can get more participation. I think that is a real yeah. positive, um, Upside, and I love your uh, perspective of this new muscle. I totally agree. You need to, yeah. You need to have I, that. New I like the square. I mean, we've we've actually chatted. I don't know if we'll ever go back to having big rooms with people in it because you have a voice, you have a face, and I do believe, especially for women, uh, John, who cannot always speak up, it's an opportunity for them to have their own space. They ha they can have their own voice all individuals because sometimes they have great ideas but they don't always voice them so having you know when you each person has their own square you can actually kind of see well who's who's has an opinion who's spoken up who who do i want to call on here and ask them if they have an opinion so i like the idea of everybody having their own space when you're having a meeting if you have to be virtual because you get lost in translation especially if you have that large leader in the room and everybody else is around them, then sometimes they only kind of adhere to their voice. This is an opportunity for others to really have that voice. I was just, I saw a joke on Twitter from a friend that said, hey, I run all the meetings now because I can mute people. So, <laughs> <laughs> if someone starts talking, that. you're <laughs> muted, bye-bye. So again, this is a whole new muscle, great stuff. Well, since you, brought, yeah. since you brought up your role, I know you have a new expanded role. Could you take a minute to explain what that is? Because I'm still not clear. I know you've been doing an amazing yeah. job. I've written about uh, your initial successes and now you continue to do well with public sector. And believe me, it's exploding. I see it, we're reporting on it. Public service is changing with digital transformation. Yeah. But these other things, what are you working on? What are the new areas? 
Yeah, so I just passed my 10th year. I'm starting my 11th year, and it's been, like, amazing building this public sector business. I, I And our government customers, wow, the innovation and in education during COVID has been pretty off the charts, which I don't think will slow down. And then a few months ago, I was asked to take on our, um, our training and certification org, and our evangelist and solution architecture org, along with the industry business units of uh, finance, telecommunications, and energy. And then, uh, John, if you remember in June, I announced our aerospace and satellite industry business unit. So um, these are the ones that we have right now are very regulated. A lot of them are you know, very closely aligned to a regulated industry. Um, you know, there could be others that are not as regulated, but the ones right now, if you think about aerospace and satellite, financial services, yeah. telecommunications, and in, in, in energy. So they, for me, um, they're very akin to a lot of the work I've been doing in building public sector, because when I go into a country today, when my teams go in, we generally always have to work with these groups. So if you think about telecommunications, we have to go in and make sure that we're working on our uh, networking, our connectivity, and we negotiate and work with those telco providers. Same with the energy companies, uh, both large ones and small ones. We go in and we uh, work to build uh, power purchasing agreements, that, you know, solar power, uh, renewable energy to power our data centers and make sure that we're giving back to the grid. So we have that partnership. And then in the financial sector, I've had our, uh, I've had all of our regulators anyway, like FINRA, Fed Reserve, um, I, IRS, Treasury. So I've already, I've always had all the regulators. So now working with the, um, you know, the additional, the banking, the investment sector, capital markets, it's very, it's, it seems so natural if that makes sense. And now diving into the upstream and downstream of supply chain for both uh, energy and telco. And what a fantastic time now for telcos with 5G. I mean, I've been saying for two or three years that I thought this would um, be a huge opportunity for telecommunications companies to actually look for new uh, work streams for their customers. And I mean, Edge, you know, now our connect, our call centers that they can do and take advantage of that. So I'm actually really excited, uh, John, seeing some of the new opportunities. And, you know, renewable, the new energy uh, startups that are out there, the things I'm seeing, power, solar, nuclear, um, and then seeing a lot of the larger energy companies take on these projects. It, it's a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm very excited now to continue to meet those customers. I got to meet a lot during reInvent. I love their energy. I, I love kind of learning about what they're looking to solve, and, and I'm also just looking forward to, to helping them um, with the connections that we've already been doing in government. I think it's a really nice combination of working together now. Yeah, I see it as um, what you've done with public sector was take a partnership approach to an old standing industry, change them quickly, get the transformation, build the relationships, get the successes and establish that transformation. And it's needed versus the organically yeah, developing, yeah. you know, stuff that's going to be like startups and whatnot. Those are going to use Amazon, well, but you're a transformational if, if leader. You think, John, if I could just say for a minute, if you think about reinvention, you know, we're at reinvent and a lot of these are going through massive reinvention. Uh, you know, again, 5G with telco, renewables uh, with energy, and then financial services where uh, everything is kind of moving to an online model and digital model with different types of currencies that they have to deal with. It's, it's really perfect for cloud and what we offer. So I think the opportunity um, to dive in and really partner with these industries and aerospace and satellite, oh my gosh, I, it's just, I, I have to say, I really do believe cloud computing is um, the perfect kind of step forward with all these industries for reinvention and innovation, which they're all um, moving toward. Well, Teresa, you're a reinvention leader. Uh, we've covered it. And now we got all new territory for you to, to work on. Um, bring your playbook, you know, people centric, partner, results. <laughs> Hard charging. Yep, Teresa, that's right. thank you. Thank you for We're your time. We're backwards from the customer.
Great to have you on. Great to see you. Wish you we were in person in real life again soon. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. John, thank you. Happy holidays. I look forward to seeing you next year. Cheers. Okay, this is the Cube's coverage of AWS reInvent. We had Teresa Carlson, she heads up the public sector. She's the chief of the whole public sector and now taking on other industries to bring that playbook, the reinvention to the industries, really a big part of the Amazon Web Services vision and cultural change that's going on with the pandemic, rechanging re and reformatting and refactoring industries. That's what's going on in the big picture and a lot of great tech under the hood. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching. <laughs>